You're listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast, episode number 103. Welcome to the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast. Business advice so easy, you'll feel like you're cheating. And now your host, Amy Porterfield. Welcome back to another episode of the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Porterfield, and I am absolutely delighted that you've tuned in. So thanks so much for being here. Today's episode is all about e-commerce strategies, and I'll be the first to admit that I am not an expert in e-commerce. That's why I have a very special guest today. His name is Steve Chow, and he owns the site MyWifeQuitHerJob.com. Now, Steve literally did create a business where his wife could quit her job because in the first year of building his online store, he was able to bring in enough money to supplement his wife's $100,000 salary in her corporate job. So she really did quit. She came home to be with her kids and help with their growing e-commerce site. Now, Steve's unique because he also has an online training program. So he knows a lot about e-commerce, but he also is well-versed in the info marketing space. So he brings a really unique perspective to the show today. We are going to be talking about Google ads and Facebook ads and specifically Facebook targeting and Facebook scaling and so many different strategies that he has been using in order to grow his e-commerce site. Now, in addition to that, we're going to be talking about webinars and some new strategies that I've never tried that Steve is actually using to get people to sign up for his webinars and buy his online training program. So as you can see, we have a lot to cover today. Now, one of the conversations Steve and I got into during the episode was all about scaling your Facebook ads. Have you ever had the experience where maybe you're paying $3 per lead for your Facebook ads and all of a sudden it jumps to let's say six or $7 a lead? It's frustrating, right? Well, because we talked about this in the show, I promised to make a freebie video to help you understand why that happens when you're trying to scale your ads and give you a few strategies to help you kind of work through it. So that's the freebie for today's episode. And the freebie video that I'm going to give to you about scaling your Facebook ads is not just for e-commerce sites. It will work if you are running ads to grow your list for your consulting or coaching business or your info product. So it kind of works across the board. So if you want to get your hands on my special Facebook ad scaling training video, all you need to do is go to amyporterfield.com forward slash one zero three download. So amyporterfield.com forward slash 103 download, or just text the phrase 103 download to the number 33444, and you can get your hands on it instantly. So I won't make you wait any longer. We have so much to cover. I'm so excited for you to meet Steve. Let's go ahead and jump into it. Steve, thanks so much for being with me here today. I really appreciate it. Great to be here, Amy. So I want people to know a little bit more about you. I gave you an intro in the beginning, but you didn't even get to hear it. So because of that, tell us about how you got to where you are today, about these multiple businesses that you have, and just kind of what life looks like now that things have kind of really switched up for you over the years. Yeah. So I, I have no idea what you said about me earlier, Amy, <laughs> but I'll assume that it's it's all lies. <laughs> uh, so I run a variety of businesses. One, I run an e-commerce store with my wife that sells wedding linens and wedding handkerchiefs. I run a blog at mywifequitterjob.com where I kind of document like all the step-by-step stuff related to e-commerce. I teach a class uh, that teaches people e-commerce. And then I run a podcast that just interviews. You You were a guest on my podcast. It was yeah. very see. What's the podcast called? It's called My Wife Quit Her Job Podcast. Very original. <laughs> <laughs> I like to keep the branding the same. I do too. I do too. So yeah, so that's basically what I run. Um, it all started with that e-commerce store, which we started because my wife wanted to quit her job uh, in order to stay at home with our kids. And where we live in the Silicon Valley, it's just really expensive. And in order to get a house in a good school district, you pretty much need two incomes she was making six figures at the time. I didn't feel like eating Hot Pockets and ramen for every meal. And so we thought about businesses that we could start and we landed on e-commerce and selling wedding handkerchiefs of all things. Now, what do, do you still have your nine to five job? I do actually. It's, it's only four days a week now. And what do you do? 
I do microprocessor design. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that you still have going on, but then you've been able to build these amazingly successful businesses. I mean, I say on the side, but they have to be, you know, a big piece of your focus. And so you started the wedding e-commerce site and then you had some success with that and you decided, wait a second, I could teach this. Is that how it worked? Yeah. So the e-commerce store ended up doing a hundred thousand in the first year and it's been growing in the double and triple digits since 2007. Wow. And then the course and the blog is probably going to do about 700,000 this year. So wow. the, the revenue, I, I don't really need to be working, but it's very hard to be doing microprocessor design like on your own, you kind of need a lot of funding to do hardware design. So that's kind of why I've stuck with the day job. Okay. Gotcha. I think it sounds fantastic. I love that you've been able to juggle all of this. And I'm assuming your wife is now working from home or helping. Does she help you with the businesses? She actually is in charge of the e-commerce store now. So she kind of goes in, in the morning, we have a couple of employees that pack and ship orders in an office. And in the afternoon, she pretty much is a full-time taxi driver. You are such a, oh, to your kids. To your kids, yes. I'm like, wait a second, no, how does yeah. that fit in? Well, you know, you can relate to that, right? Oh, many, yeah. Can, I only yeah. have one, and I feel like I am driving him around all the time. Yes. Now, if they had Uber for kids, oh. which they kind of do, but I'm waiting for that to take <laughs> off, because that'll free up a lot of time. Amazing. Okay, so you've got these businesses going on, and we want to talk about a few different things today. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about your e-commerce training program, because I want to talk to you about what that looks like and how you created it and how you market it. And I also want to talk about how to market online for e-commerce, because I do not teach e-commerce. I typically sell to people that want to create online training programs, products, and services. So e-commerce is something that's a little bit foreign to me. So we want to talk about how you market online with e-commerce. And then in addition, I want to talk to you about some amazing success that you've had with webinars for your e-commerce training. So do you think we can get it all in? We can. Okay. So first, actually, I'm going to kind of flip things around and I want to talk to you about just e-commerce in general. What have you seen in terms of marketing online, especially I'm interested in Facebook and Instagram and, and some of the, of the other sites that you think are really effective for e-commerce marketing? Yeah. So it really depends on what you're selling and what your value proposition is. But if it's something that lends itself good for searches, any sort of Google pay-per-click advertising, especially Google shopping converts very well. Okay. Um, if you tend to sell goods that are really crowded for a particular set of keywords that people are searching for, for example, like t-shirts, you would never be able to make money buying search ads for t-shirts because it's so competitive. But with Facebook, where you can target a very specific set of individuals, Facebook advertising tends to work well for those products. So I'll give you an example. Let's say um, you're a New England Patriots fan, and like last year when they won the Super Bowl, you decided to create some t-shirts that were very specific. You could target people in New England who like football, and your conversion rate would tend to be pretty good. Okay. I like that. Now, for your wedding business, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you use Facebook ads. We use Facebook ads and we use, we make a lot of money off of Google ads as well. Okay. And the Google ads talk to us a little bit about how that works. Yeah. So we sell, so our primary products are wedding handkerchiefs, linen towels, linen napkins, and personalized goods. And so let's start, well, we're going to pack all this in an hour. Okay. So if we start with AdWords, which are just regular search based ads, I might bid on a keyword like wedding handkerchiefs. And every time, I, I only pay when someone actually clicks on the ad to land on my site. And if your conversion rate is high enough, you can make a profit doing those things. Okay, so that's one way to do it with Google AdWords. Google also offers this advertising platform called Google Shopping. And I don't know if you've noticed, Amy, but when you type in a search query in Google, sometimes you see these pictures of products and their prices, right? Yep. And so if something like that appeals to you and you click on it, uh, I pay for that click, and if you end up making a purchase, that's great. But those ads tend to convert much higher because you see the price and the picture beforehand before you do the click. Okay, gotcha. And so so yeah. they're a true warm audience. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Now, the problem with Facebook with e-commerce 
is that unlike Google, when you're actually searching for something, like when I take something in Google, I'm searching for something, and most like, more likely than not, if it's a product, I'm looking to buy that product, right? Yep. Whereas with Facebook, you might be just checking out cat videos or something or checking out on <laughs> what your friends are up to, right? Right. And so the intent to purchase might not necessarily be there. And so the Facebook strategy with e-commerce tends to be a lot different than what you would take with Google. Okay, so if the strategy is different, do you mean it's just not nearly as powerful? Or are you doing things in your Facebook ads that are going to make them more effective? Like, you know how Facebook advertising works really well. And you know how it works with, like, marketing a webinar or marketing a freebie for an info-based product. But what do you see works a whole lot in, in, in a whole lot different way with e-commerce? And do you have any tips or tricks for that? Yeah. So what's funny about this is I started uh, trying to run my Facebook ads in the very beginning, just like Google ads, right? Yeah. I would have these ads just point to like a category of products and it was not doing well at all. And on the flip side here, I was running Facebook ads for like my courses and, and that sort of thing. And for some reason, it took me a while to kind of marriage the fact that the two strategies are actually quite similar whether you're selling products or whether you're selling courses. Really? So what, yeah. So what I decided to do with the e-commerce end was I ended up pointing those ads at a content page that described my products. And then within that content, I had buy links to my products. I was gathering email addresses and I had just add to cart buttons within that content. And so through a series of collecting email addresses, getting people to sometimes click directly on the products and buy and then kind of retargeting those people directly. Right. That was how I was able to make Facebook ads profitable for me. Okay, so if you're cool with it, can I link to one of those content pages in our show notes? Yes, absolutely. Because I would love people to see that because you said you were actually growing your email list. How so? So I, I can go into a little bit more specific for now. So that, that one article that I'm just thinking about right now is called Nine Unique Ways to Make Your Wedding Extra Special. Oh, so you were basically sending people to a blog post. Yes. Okay. And do you have a blog on your e-commerce site? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, what was the topic again? Say it again. It was Nine Unique Ways to Make Your Wedding Extra Special. So basically, you know, when you get married, brides often look for, you know, unique DIY projects to make their wedding special. I'm not a wedding expert, by the way. This is like my wife talking here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I wrote that post, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, basically, we have these cool arts and crafts projects on our site. You know, SEO is very important for an e-commerce store as well. So my wife puts out these projects, uh, craft projects, made with the products that we sell online. And so um, the one uh, that particular article was basically an amalgamation of all these different things that you can buy for your wedding to make it cool and personalized. So... We have this like wedding dress hanky that's personalized where you can personalize the initials or the bridegroom and wedding date on there. And we'd kind of describe how to make that. And then right below, there's like an add to cart link. Meanwhile, okay. on that same page, there's like a pop-up form, a sign-up form above the content, below the content, and in the sidebar as well. Okay. So this is really good to hear because I was curious to know in an e-commerce world, if content still is so very valuable, like it is in our info marketing world. And you're saying it is. I think it's the next wave of how people do things. Like, so remember when we first got on, I was talking about Facebook ads where you, you can actually get away with pointing them directly at products. If your audience is niched down so tight that you can make that work. Okay. Cause that's what I was going to ask you. Do you ever just sell directly to a page where, okay, here it is, put it in your cart. Yes. Okay. And so, uh, one particular ad, for example, right now, this is the holiday season for us and, and everything works pretty much during the holiday season. Cause people are looking to buy whether they're on Facebook or whatnot. Okay. And so we have an ad point. We sell personalized aprons, mother, daughter aprons. So you buy a matching apron for your mom okay, and the daughter. That's pretty cute. <laughs> <laughs> and I target moms that make over $50,000 and drive fancy cars uh, based off of a lookalike audience of my existing customers for that product. Okay, that is good. This is what I always get excited about. With Facebook, <laughs> the targeting and what you decide to do in terms of targeting is just so interesting throughout the different niches. So I wouldn't have even thought like who drive fancy cars. 
but that is so brilliant. I love it. But how do you know that they have kids, the type of age, or they have a daughter, the type of age that would want to an apron with them? Yeah. So in uh, Facebook, you can actually target moms with toddlers. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So you have become a Facebook ad targeting expert, I would guess. You know, I wouldn't call myself an expert and oftentimes it's trial and error. Like it takes a while to figure out what works, right? Right. And so usually what I do is I just put out like five or 10 bucks a day on a bunch of different targets uh, with the same ad. And then I just figure out what works and kind of meld all the ad copy and the pictures all together once I figure out what works. Gotcha. I definitely yeah. agree. There's a lot of trial and error with Facebook ad targeting. And although I teach it in a lot of my programs, a lot of the times I say like, you've got to get creative and you've got to think in different ways about who these people are and their behaviors and their interests and all that good stuff, because there's some really cool things you can do. But it all comes down to, and I don't know if you agree with me, but really knowing your audience. Yeah, you really have to have a picture of who is going to be buying your products in mind. So, for example, with the wedding handkerchiefs, it's pretty easy because you can actually target people who were recently engaged, right, yes. on Facebook. Which, so. that's a huge win for you, definitely. It is. It, it's an awesome target. Now, tell me this. <laughs> have you, and I have no idea, so it's okay if you haven't, but have you experimented much with video yet? I have not. And do you see a lot of e-commerce sites experimenting with video, you know, you can do it on, of course, Instagram and Facebook. And I was just reading up on video and the fact that Facebook is just becoming this leader in all things video is just, they're blowing everybody out of the water. And so, and I was talking to my good friend, James Wedmore, who does a lot of Facebook video ads. And he was talking mm -hmm. about how they're just crushing compared to his image ads. And I'm wondering, are you seeing e-commerce jumping on the video bandwagon when it comes to advertising? That's that's an interesting question. So I actually really like looking at my Facebook feed because I always find new e-commerce products to Me too. buy. So for example, yeah. I was looking at Canary the other day. What's that? Uh, it's like this home uh, surveillance system. <laughs> that's a great name. It's okay. like always on. And uh, there, I, you know, I was thinking to myself, that ad would have done pretty well with video. Uh, I haven't seen a whole lot of it, to be honest with you. Um, I think with e-commerce, it's tough. Unlike with courses where like the return on investment is like a bajillion percent. Uh, with our e-commerce store, our average order size is between $50 and $60. And so you have to be extra careful with your targeting in order to make things work. It really all yes. depends on margins. And I would even go as far as to say is if you're not making at least like 50 bucks per sale, it might be a little harder to make Facebook ads work. Okay. Unless you have an incredible back end and email sequence. Okay. So this is good to know. That's the kind of stuff I wanted to hear from you, what you think might be the right, you know, right road to go down and when Facebook would work and when it might not work, because there are some people that come to me and say, well, Amy, my product's just $20. Should I be doing Facebook advertising? And my gut usually is saying, well, you know, it kind of depends, like you just said. And I think it's a, a hard road to go down when that price point is so low. Well, so this is how you can do it. You can gather email addresses to your content pages and you can have a separate list just from your Facebook leads. And oftentimes throughout the lifetime of that sequence that you might have, you can make your Facebook ads profitable. Uh, 20 bucks might be hard, but again, it just really depends on how repeatable your product is to yes. buy. Like if it's a consumable, for example, pretty sure you can make your money back, right? Yeah. You have these emails that kind of remind them when to replenish their stock. Um, but in general, for a wedding type of item, and you know, the divorce rate is high in this country, but most people <laughs> don't come back for 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 more. Um. So you can get them on other things like upsell them on getting handkerchiefs, for example, for their bridal party and that sort of thing. And those are all things that you can make your average order size larger after the fact with an email sequence. And you can target those people on your email list with Facebook ads with these upsells. Yes. Yeah. So yes. the retargeting, I think, could be really valuable, especially for e-commerce and in the ways that we're talking about. How about Instagram? Do you use Instagram? We are just starting up our Instagram account. Um, it's actually very powerful from some of the Instagram experts that I've talked to. Yeah, I would uh, think so with e-commerce, but especially with the wedding industry. Mm -hmm, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So e-commerce so, is one. What were you going to say? No, I was going to just say, here's my dilemma here. And you asked about video, and I was, I've was i been trying to get my wife to do video, but she's just very shy. 
And it's not like you can get like a Chinese guy to come up and talk about wedding <laughs> stuff, right? Just wouldn't work. Yes, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> so we've got to get your wife to start thinking like, okay, maybe this video thing is right for me, but that's why I don't do tons of video. And I know I need to, but I don't necessarily love being on video. And it's not something that comes natural to me. And I know a lot of people listening can totally relate to this. And so I really do think video is where it's at. And I really do think video is going to be even bigger in, you know, 2016 and beyond. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, um, you know, just speaking from one entrepreneur to another, we also need to know where our strengths are and where we can focus and where we can see the biggest bang for our buck. And so Mm -hmm. it's just a a decision we've got to make. Uh, One thing I forgot to mention is, you know, with retargeting on Facebook with an e-commerce store. What's really nice is they have what's called Facebook dynamic ad retargeting. So based on exactly which products that a customer actually looked at when they were browsing your store, those products, those exact products will be shown to the customer in the ad. Okay, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. And so I get between 10 and 12x return on investment on those Facebook dynamic product ads. Okay, so that's definitely something for anybody in e-commerce to look into is these dynamic Facebook ads because the fact that, I mean, it's exactly what happens. I look at something on one of my favorite sites and all of a sudden I see it inside of my Facebook newsfeed, like within minutes. It kind of reminds me when I accidentally clicked on your blog and then all of a sudden I was seeing you on every (laughs) single page. I was following you everywhere. (laughs) Yeah, funny how that works. Well, I want to transition a bit and talk to you about the amazing success. I mean, $700,000 this year in your programs and products to teach people what you've learned through your e-commerce experience. So do you have more than one program or do you just have one? I only have one. Okay. Tell me about this program because now we're going to transition into this interview for those that want to create an online training program, or you've been creating one. And I always like to hear about other people's programs and some of the details of the programs, the price points and all that good stuff, just to give you ideas in terms of creating your own program. So what is the program called? The program is called Create a Profitable Online Store. So who is the target market? I, because of the nature of my blog, I tend to attract a lot of parents who want to stay at home with their kids. Okay. But in general, it applies to anyone who wants to learn how to sell physical products online. Okay, cool. And you were going to say something I cut you off before. I don't remember what that was now, Amy. (laughs) That's okay. (laughs) So um, I wanted to ask you the name of your product, who your target market is, and then tell me a little bit about this product. What does it look like? And, you know, um, how many modules? What's the price point? Give me some details. Yeah. So the the course is called Create a Profitable Online Store. It currently sells for $997, catering to anyone who wants to learn how to sell physical products online. And do you have a payment plan for that? I do. Okay, great. Because that's a big thing that we've been talking a lot about on the podcast. When you have a 997 program, those payment plans make a huge difference. And how many modules? So my class is unlike others in that it's an ongoing thing. Like I'm constantly adding to it every single week. So the number of modules, it kind of runs like Fizzle, if you guys are familiar with Fizzle. I am, but talk to us about that in case somebody isn't. Yeah, so physical is, is uh, well, my class, I'm constantly adding new content every single week. So the number of modules actually grows all the time. And as the amount of content grows, I tend to increase the price of the course. Oh, look at you. So what did it start out as? It, it started out at $299. Wow. And so you're already up to $997. And you just launched it this year, right? No, I've had it for a while. Okay. Um, It's been three years. Oh, for some reason, I thought it was just this year. So you've had it for three years and you've increased the prices over the years and now it's $9.97 and you continue to add to it. So do you have lifetime access? You get lifetime access. And how much are you involved in terms of real time in the course? Yeah, so I'm actually heavily involved. So I give a like a webinar once a week for like 30, 30 to 45 minutes where I kind of answer people's questions live. And then there's a forum and then there's email support. Okay, cool. And do you have a big team behind you for your info marketing business? I do not have a big team. It's basically me and an assistant. Okay. That's all. <laughs> yeah. That's I thought it. you were going to say something else. <laughs> no, no, that's it. And the assistant basically handles all of like the media stuff, like the audio video. And the rest of it is just me. 
That's awesome. One thing I've learned about you, and we've only talked a few times, but I feel like you keep things pretty simple. Is that just an illusion or am I, no, am I, I always, onto something? And that's the only way I can do it, right? I work full time. I have these other businesses. And so I have to keep these simple. Otherwise I get overwhelmed, right? Okay. So this is a little off topic, but give me some tips or at least one tip that you kind of subscribe to in terms of keeping things simple that might be different than other people trying to do this. Because most people, when I talk to them and they don't have an online training program, they'll say to me, well, I'm working on it, but they've in honesty been working on it for over a year now. And so what's one thing you do to keep things more simpler than maybe the next guy? I mean, I could tell you how I got started. I actually launched this course by just telling people that I was going to do it and I had nothing. And basically, I got 30 signups right away, 35 signups right away. And then all of a sudden, I was like, crap, I need to produce the content. And so that's <laughs> kind of how I got started. That's how a lot of people get started. I obviously, you know, teach webinars. And I say you could do a live workshop, which is kind of what you did in terms of sell it and then you create it. And I feel mm -hmm. like if you ever need a kick in the pants to get something done, that is a great way to do it. Now... Speaking of webinars this year, and tell me if I'm wrong, but this year was the first year you did webinars. Yes. It okay. was the first year. Yes. Free webinars to get people into your program. That's correct. Okay. So let's set this up a little bit because you have some amazing results with webinars and I want to break it down a little bit. First of all, um, what is the topic of your webinar? Like what is the title? I mean, that's a good question. I, I can't even remember what's on the top of the slide, but basically I run through the very basics on how to get your first sale online. Okay. So how to get your first sale online uh -huh. and you did your very first webinar and talk to me about what that looked like. Did you have the pre-webinar sequence? Did you have a follow-up? How many people were on? Just kind of run me through your very first webinar. Yeah. So <laughs> it's funny because I ended up watching yours probably like 11 times. Oh no, you <laughs> had to have gotten sick of me. <laughs> I, I, I knew exactly your entire presentation <laughs> for, your, for, your, um, for your product. And I ended up following pretty much the exact same strategy, but you know, obviously different because we're selling completely different items. But I didn't really have so much of a pre-launch sequence because my very first webinar, I basically launched it to the people on my email list. So they okay. already kind of knew me. I didn't really need to warm them, warm them up or anything. Yep. And so that first webinar, which was just an email blast out to my list, I had 1,320 people registered. And then 480 people ended up attending. And then 12.3% ended up buying. Which is and, uh, huge, it, you know. Do you know that's huge? See, that's the thing. I've been asking around and it seems like it's anywhere between five and 15%. Yeah. And I don't hear many 15%. So your numbers are really strong. And I just want to point out, you know, to make this a training type episode is that you've been nurturing these people. These people were on your list. They weren't a cold audience, which we can do webinars to a cold audience. And I'm sure you have, but they already are subscribed to the fact that they like what you've got and they want to hear more. So that is just a great argument for why it's important to reach out to your list on a regular basis and nurture them. Okay. Keep going with your stats. Okay. So that first webinar made 60 K and as we were kind of talking earlier, I actually don't like doing webinars I know. and then you yelled at me. I was wondering if we were going to talk about that. Okay. So <laughs> Steve does not like doing webinars. So he said, I would do more, but I don't really like doing them. Now, one thing I love about that is that let's stop forcing ourselves to do things in our business as entrepreneurs that we do not enjoy doing. So I think it's cool that you're honest about that. And then I asked you, why do you not like doing webinars? So talk to me about that. Yeah. And so the reason I actually like public speaking, but okay. with a webinar, I don't get any feedback from the audience. And that's what I don't like about it. Gotcha. Now, did you ever listen to, well, you wouldn't have listened to it yet, but I did a podcast episode with Tim page of conversion cast and lead pages. Mm -hmm. And he actually did the same type of interview I did with him on his own show. Did you ever hear him talk about webinars and getting engagement? No, I have not. Okay. So what he said, and I'll just kind of sum it up really quick is when he does webinars, he is 
constantly looking at the comment section. And it's a thing that's really difficult for me to do. And we talked about how it's really awkward in the beginning, but he'll be going through his content and constantly answering questions that are popping up in the moment in the comment section. And his webinars are like a full hour of conversation he's having with everybody that is there live. And here's the cool thing, Steve, the cool thing is one, he gets that engagement and he feels like he's really there with them. I know you can't see them, but he feels like he's there with them. And also it skyrocketed his revenue. His conversion rate too? Yes. His conversion rate. So you got to check out that episode. Um, I can't even think off the top of my head what number it is, but it is in December and I did the interview with Tim Page all about engagement and webinars, but I think you would really like it. So I think that might change your attitude around engagement and uh, the audience. So that's just one thing. But here's the deal. You did a $60,000 webinar on your very first webinar. Were you like, what the heck? Were you, you must have been very proud of yourself. So I, I didn't know what to expect, to be honest. And so I was like, okay, I don't like doing these, but 60,000, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll do another one just and to see what happens. So and you so did another. I did another, but this one was just Facebook traffic this time. Okay. So how many people were on it? So this one, I had 1,032 registered and 320 people arrived. And then the conversion rate was 9.1% on that one. Okay. So who did you target for that one? Yeah. So- one, so it, actually it wasn't pure Facebook because I actually emailed the prior workshop attendees to, you know, in case they missed it because cool. not, not everyone attends, right? Right. And then after that, I started targeting people who were on my fan page, people who had visited my site, period, and people who were on my email list also. Great. Again, here's the power of building a tribe and using Facebook advertising and targeting specifically in order to attract a warmer audience. Because I was gonna say, if you had 9% conversion on a really cold audience, I've never even heard of that. So the fact that your, it fell a little bit because they weren't directly from your email list, but still really high. You know, most people, if they're being really honest with their webinar conversions, are in the two, 3%, especially a 100% if they're just starting out. So I hope you know that your numbers are incredible. That's interesting. Okay. So then the one I did after that ended up converting at 13.8%. Shut up. Just shut your mouth. 13.8%. Now who, who were they? So again, I emailed the prior workshops from the past two workshops to attend. And then I did the same Facebook targeting. And I also started targeting lookalikes for my students for that one. Okay. Tell people in case they're new, what, what is a lookalike audience and, and how do you do that? Yeah, it's basically when you upload your email list, and in this case, it was people who had purchased my class up to Facebook, and then Facebook will find people who are similar in demographics to within a percent of what you have uploaded. And I really strongly believe in lookalike audiences. I don't think it's the first place to start. Like I like the idea of targeting your own email list and your traffic to your website and your Facebook fans. But once you've done that, you did exactly what I would suggest. And that is let's expand with a lookalike audience. So what's really crazy is the lookalike audience, plus those that had been invited to your previous sessions you got an even higher conversion rate. But let's be really clear. You're inviting people that did not buy your product, but they did sign up for a webinar. Mm -hmm. And so what, does it matter if they attended it or not? So here's what's funny. Um, A lot of the people who purchased on that third webinar were people who had actually attended the same one two times before. Okay, this is so good. I didn't even know that. So I love that you're giving me even new information. Okay. So you're telling me that they were on the first webinar and on the second webinar, and this is the same webinar, same exact, almost exact webinar. Okay, guys, we just learned something new and I might have to include this in my webinar program that there's something about getting people to re-engage with you and they are you have to have a really good webinar in order for people to want to watch it three times. But also it's such a great reminder that people don't always buy right away. They could be on the fence. Something might be going on in their life and we've got to go reach out back to them and invite them on. I don't think I've ever done that. Now I typically invite my entire list to my webinars. And so they've probably been invited a few times, but 
segmentation is smarter. So the way you're doing it, segmenting your list and saying, look, these are the people that signed up for my webinar, haven't bought, let's get them on and then look at your results. So I just learned something new and I, I hope those that do webinars are really paying attention. Let's get the people that have already signed up back on your webinar. And now that I think about it, Steve, I'm talking a lot. I must be really excited about this, <laughs> but and I'm going to let you talk. But the reason I'm thinking about this is I might not always email those that have already been on my webinar. So listen, if, if I see huge results with this, you're getting all the credit. <laughs> so I, I want to talk about some mistakes I did too, which are just classic Facebook ads mistakes, which, which I'm sure no one in your class would ever make. Never, but, never, never. But let's talk about them. Um, so I was doing really well with just uh, marketing to people who had visited my site before and with my lookalike audience. And so I wanted to just try to max out the attendance on one of my webinars. And so I ended up upping the daily budget by 4x the following day to see how many people I could get. And then my cost per acquisition went through the roof. And I know from e-commerce land, and you can tell me if you share the same experience, but whenever I try to do this by more than 50%, on my e-commerce ads, I tend to like lose a lot of money. <laughs> right, exactly. But I got really greedy with um, these webinars because the the return on investment is just so high, right? Right. I, I only have to sell one of these at a thousand bucks and I can spend a thousand dollars on Facebook ads. I mean, incredible. But it ended up not working out so well. Um, so instead of like 350 per acquisition, it, it ballooned up to like almost $6. Okay. So I want to make sure I'm really clear. So basically you were doing really good and you were getting your cost per lead was really low. So you added more money to it and then yes. it got up to $6. Yes. Okay. So do you know why that happened? Um, I have my suspicions and, and no one really knows hundred percent how Facebook ads works, but whenever I used to do this in e-commerce land, it, it, the same thing happened, but I'm always more careful in e-commerce land because my average sale is like 50 to 60 bucks. Right. Right. And so I, I came out profitable on that campaign. And so I guess in theory, it was the right thing to do, but I was just curious what you do with your ads. So one of the things that I have a guy that helps me with my Facebook ads now, and he recorded a video and it's um, a video that he just recorded for me. And what I'm going to ask him to do is actually re-record it and I'll put it in the show notes, but I'm just going to tell you about it now, Steve, and then I'll send it to you. And that is that he talks about the fact that there's only so many people that you can go after, like the low hanging fruit, that they're going to be a really low cost per lead. But mm -hmm. when you start adding more to it, you're asking Facebook, go out and find more of them. And now that pool gets a little bit smaller, but quite honestly, he explains it so well and in detail, his name's Jonathan. So mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Jonathan to make a video. I'm going to put it in the show notes and I'll make sure I send it to you, Steve, because it really does explain why this is happening. And I thought he did an excellent job with it. So I'm teasing you all with this little <laughs> freebie, but you're going to have to go to the show notes to check it out. So here's the thing. That audience was actually quite large. So I'm pretty sure I didn't tap that out. It just so happens. I bet if I ran a consistent campaign over a longer duration with the same budget, I would have had similar results on a cost per acquisition case. But the fact that I just flooded everything up front, I, I'm guessing what's happening is everyone got flooded with these ads also and you know, all at once. And it because because the audience for that was over a million people, which normally I, I don't do in e-commerce land, but in uh chorus land, I, I feel it's okay since I have such a huge margin for error. Which is really cool. And I love that. But one thing you said that I thought was really interesting. Uh, reminded me of a call I just had yesterday. I was, I mentioned James Wedmore earlier in our interview. And one thing he said after every promotion he does is that, gosh, I wish I spent more on Facebook ads. And it's funny that even you said, if, if I would have, you know, kept going with that, it probably would have proved to be really valuable. And I actually still feel like $6.50 per lead when you're selling a $1,000 program, I still think you're safe. Yeah. But it's just hard to see it go from three to six so quickly like that. It's like, oh, gut check there. But um, I think that once you have something working and you're scaling them, and sometimes it's tricky to scale, and that's why I want to include that video. But usually when you have a really good promotion, you look back and think, oh, I wish I spent a little bit more on ads because I would have had more people on that webinar. So here's actually what I do now, and this is something I don't know if you've seen with your webinars and Facebook ads, but you know the long, the farther out from the webinar 
I am, the conversion rate tends to be lower. Oh, yeah. And so I actually don't even run the ads until like four days before the workshop now. And now I increase the budget by 50 to 100% each day leading up to the webinar. And so that last day or the day before, I'm, I'm maxing out my budget at that time. I think that's a really cool strategy. We usually get in front of it about seven days in advance, but no more than that. But I could see why you might do the four days in advance. And also, I think that could increase the number of people that actually show up live. Mm -hmm. You know, the more you get um, in front of it, meaning 10, 14 days filling up your webinar, you're going to have a really hard time getting those people to show up live. Now for these webinars, so did you use a pre-webinar onboarding sequence, meaning sending them emails to encourage them to get on live? So I actually send them an email, which kind of introduces me a little bit. Like I have a podcast, which I just kind of put out and I have a couple of articles that kind of explain who I am and, and what I do. And I kind of send that out to kind of warm them up a little bit. But outside of that one email, I don't really send anything. Really? Interesting. Well, I remind them that the webinar is coming up, but I don't give them any more background. Okay. Gotcha. I don't give a lot of content in terms of teaching and all that good stuff but I definitely send a series of emails to make sure that they show up live and encourage. Oh yeah, yeah. I do that for sure. Okay, good. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure. I, I use the Porterfield method for that. Yes. <laughs> Lovely. And you obviously are sending out a follow-up sequence as well. Yes. The follow-up sequence is very important. Very important, right? For those of you who don't know, basically what I teach and what Steve does in his webinars is after the webinar, we send a replay, which is pretty common for most people, but then we send a series of emails and these emails are going to encourage people that are still on the fence to either jump in or jump out, depending on if the program is right for them. So it, they're full of information about the product and the benefits and the features and some testimonials and stories and all that good stuff. And I, I know that you do this too, but I make sure to give out a freebie with every email that I send to encourage them to actually open it and take action on something. Oh. I, like I give them an incentive. Yeah. Okay. Whoa. Let's talk about this. You mean in the follow-up sequence? Yeah. So um, I don't know if you had a chance to watch my webinar, but during that webinar, I show them tools and these spreadsheets that I use to kind of calculate profitability and right. that sort of thing. And then I tell people not to take notes during the webinar because I'm going to send this stuff to them. And so with each email that I send after the webinar, I include one of those items that I'd said I include during the webinar. Ooh, and so that's people open really the good. Yeah, to grab that freebie. Okay, no, I haven't done it, done it that way, but I really like these ideas. This is really good. Maybe you should be teaching my webinar course. <laughs> <laughs> Webinars for e-commerce, there you go. So this is fantastic information. So giving them those freebies after the fact. So why that is so very smart of you, you already know this, but I just want to put it out there for my audience, is that after a webinar, the people that are opening up those emails are genuinely interested in what you shared, or they missed the replay, or they missed the live webinar, and they're still curious. So these freebies are just building trust and engagement and getting them to see what you're all about, giving them a little taste of what your program might be about as well. So I think that's, that's really brilliant. I want to commend you for your amazing success with webinars. I hope you fall in love with them. I think, um, <laughs> I want you to listen to that Tim page interview I did because the engagement might be something really cool for you. I think you would love it. So again, though, congrats on your success. Thanks. I mean, I, I learned from the master, so. Oh, you are too good to me for sure. You had so <laughs> much going on for you before, but I'm, I'm so glad to be a little bit, a little part of it. So thank you for that. <laughs> so I, I know we covered a lot. We talked about your e-commerce businesses and creating a product to help people with e-commerce and also the webinars that you ran in terms of getting people to learn more about your e-commerce product. But through this whole wild ride of building an online business and getting to um, get your wife to stay home with your kids and all this entire experience, what do you think is one of your biggest pieces of advice for anybody that has an e-commerce product? When we're talking about business and marketing and all that good stuff, where do you think that you could help people the most in terms of where they're at with their, their products? Well, I'll answer that first part of your question first. I think when it comes to selling an e-commerce product or, or any product for that matter, you have to make sure that you have something unique. You have your unique value proposition associated with it. Uh, one of the number one problems that I see when people sign up for my class is they pick 
an item that's either too saturated or doesn't have enough demand. So you have to check those things too. But oftentimes those people sell me too products that just kind of blend in with everyone else's. If you find a unique product or something about your product that is better than everyone else's, it will end up selling by itself. Yes. I love that. That is so very true. It kind of comes back to knowing your audience and knowing what they need and what they want and having something really unique out there. Well, I cannot thank you enough for coming on my show. I knew that you would deliver a lot of value, but you popped in here with some information I didn't even know that you kind of knocked my socks off with. So thank (laughs) you for sharing that. And uh, thank you so much for caring so much to help my audience learn more about this e-commerce world and also talk webinars. Thanks for having me, Amy. Take care. Take care. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Steve as much as I have. I really loved talking about the Facebook ad targeting and Facebook ad scaling, as well as some of his strategies that he does in his follow-up sequence for his webinar, which I thought was really unique and something I might try out as well. So I hope you're walking away today with some really valuable tips that you are going to apply to your business as well. Don't forget that I created that extra special freebie for this episode all about scaling your Facebook ads. You can get it at amyporterfield.com forward slash 103 download, or you can text the phrase 103 download to the number 33444. So don't forget to get your hands on that. I think you're going to find it really valuable. It will be valuable for those who have an e-commerce business, but also for those that have a consulting or coaching or info marketing business, and you are running Facebook ads to grow your email list and to sell more online. So the video is universal in that respect. So I hope you grab it as soon as possible. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I cannot wait to connect with you again next week. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast at www.amyporterfield.com.